it's a very unusual webinar for me here. So we've done uh, you know, half a dozen of them this week and we'll do many more and I've done hundreds of them over the years. Uh, but this time I'm sort of on the other side of the fence. Normally I'm the one who is representing Exculture and we have a client. This time uh, I and Jennifer here are sort of clients. So uh, we uh, represent the Masters of Science and International Business offered by the Bryan School of Business and Economics of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which we are part of. I happen to be the program director. And so we need your help with uh, sort of developing this program and promoting this program. But um, in addition to just talking about the program, we have invited here Jennifer Chapman uh, to talk about something bigger just than this specific one program. So uh, we would like to talk a little bit more about um, how universities recruit students. And so on the one hand, you need to know this background context story so that you can do a better job for the Masters of Science in International Business. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you all are already students probably, but many of you will continue with your education, especially at the graduate level. And I thought it would be useful for you to know how universities recruit students. I mean, for the students or from the student's perspective, the challenge is how do you get in? So you apply everywhere and you know, how do I get in, how do I get in? What you may not realize is that the universities have the same challenge. So that they, they always are fighting, you know, how do we get them in? How do we get people to apply, you know, apply to our program? And then how do we convince them to come to us and not to a competing university? And so it's a constant struggle and we sort of don't see each other's sides. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it is a challenge. And so Jennifer here is um, um, at our university. Her job is to promote our graduate programs. And I, you specialize only in graduate programs or you also do recruitment for the uh, undergraduate programs? At the Bryan School, I only recruit for the graduate programs. Graduate programs yeah. And your previous job was also in the same sector, just a different university, right? So I've worked in undergraduate recruitment as well as graduate recruitment. Right. So Jennifer's job is to convince you essentially or or students like you or people like you to apply to universities and so while you're stressing out and you know worrying if you will get admitted jennifer's job is to convince people like you to apply and so again sometimes it's challenging especially for the new programs or like now in the united states they have kind of the unexpected challenges that the economy is doing pretty well and people don't want to go back to school so they prefer to get jobs because jobs are relatively easy to get now. So when the economy crashes, everybody goes back to school and then all of a sudden we have many more applicants than we can handle. But then when the economy is doing well, uh, we actually wish we had more applications. <laughs> and so um, uh, just a few words about the program itself, Masters of Science and International Business um, of the University um, of North Carolina in Greensboro. And then maybe, or maybe let, let's start with the big picture. Jennifer, maybe let's start with you talking about this industry as a whole, and then what we here at the Bryan School of Business and Economics do to attract students to all programs, but maybe also a couple of words specifically about MSIB. And then I will talk more about the program itself, uh, what it does, you know, what, what, what's included, the curriculum, all those kinds of things that students may need to know about the program itself. But let's talk about the industry first. So sure. About, uh, <laughs> so when it comes to university recruitment, of course, it's very different across levels of study, whether you're looking at undergraduate versus graduate, on campus versus online study, uh, subject areas, it can be very different, but ultimately it comes down to a partnership between really the marketing team, the communications team, and then the recruitment team. And typically the job of marketing is to um, get the word out there, to, to, to raise awareness, um, to get, get our school on your radar. Um, um, and for the recruitment team, I really, well, and a lot of people view this differently. I personally view the job of a recruiter as to um, learn all of the features and benefits of the school, but then also listen to the needs of the students. And so listen to what the students are saying and then help them um, help make those connections between what they're looking for and what your school can offer. Um, I don't believe that every school is for every person. And I'm a, a believer in highlighting those features and benefits and letting the student decide. Um, so what I'll do is 
is make my best case for um, if they're interested in international business or something like that to, to, to share why we would be the best choice for them and then to help make those connections. And um, we do that in a variety of ways. We do that via email. We do that virtually via, you know, virtual sessions. Um, we meet students out at career fairs. Um, so it's, it's, we really use a variety of tactics and uh, tools to help kind of reach those students and make that case. So when students are choosing what school they want to go to, uh, at least in the United States, it's very common to go away from where you live. I know in some countries, uh, like for example, in my native Ukraine, at least at the time when I lived there, so it's been like 20 years since I left Ukraine, but still at that time, uh, most people would go to universities in the city where they live. So it was a little uncommon. I mean, some people would still move to a different city or even to a different country, but most people would look at universities in the town where they live. And if it's a smaller town, there may be not many choices. There may be only one or two universities. And so the way the students choose is that you just go to the website or whatever resources are available and kind of look what programs are available at that school. And then they choose which one they choose. And so uh, for the university, there is really not much need to do a recruitment campaign because the students will go through all of the program offerings and will kind of discover it on their own. <clears throat> the only I mean, the only reason to do some recruitment is if there is competition in town. Like where I grew up, we have like three major universities, and so they were competing with one another. But then again, in other countries, like in the United States, it seems to me that most students uh, go somewhere else for school. I mean, some stay in town, but most go at least to a different city within the state. Many go to a different state. Many go to a different country. Uh, many students from other countries come to us, especially at the graduate le level. It seems like even at our school, it's like half of the students are international students. And if you go to New York or, uh, I don't know, Florida, Miami, it seems like, like I, up to 80% of all of the students would be international students. So all of a sudden, the competition is much bigger, right? So you have to really, you know, <laughs> work it. So, uh, so how does it work then, you know, like, for example, how do you define the market? For example, for UNCG, I mean, how wide do you go when you're doing the recruitment? So UNCG is a unique um, school. Um, so by prior position, I was at a private uh, college and university here. UNCG is public, um, and so you were, our, at, uh, you were at Wake Forest. Or? Wake Forest University. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's yeah one of the major pr private universities in uh, our area, and definitely a main competitor when it comes to like MBA programs, for example. Absolutely. However, I was there representing their biomedical graduate programs. And so, um, you know, for those, it was it was quite straightforward. You, you develop personas for each of the program. Uh, a persona is essentially a typical student. So what does the typical student look like? Um, and thankfully, they looked very similar across the biomedical sciences um, and what they were going to either go into biomedical research or pharmaceutical development, something like that. Um, and so that was pretty straightforward. For UNCG, especially the Bryan School, um, we are blessed with a very very diverse student population. Um, they come from all sorts of backgrounds, um, socioeconomic, um, you know, experiences, uh, nationalities, um, and 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 with lots of different interests. So they come to the program uh, wanting lots of different things. So where I, I think that's a that creates a wonderful place to study. Um, it creates a very challenging place to recruit because there's no one typical student. It's very difficult to develop personas for each of the programs, um, and so and they can be quite different. And so if your personas for every program that you're developing are, are so different, um, you have to really be um, thinking strategically and how can you can you develop tactics for each of those different populations. Um, and so here at UNCG, we've, we've done we've done a lot of work on that, um, looking at, okay, who is the typical student for, you know, MSIB, for instance? Um, what would you say, Voss, if, if someone asked you? You would you'd probably say, we have not, we do not have a typical student, well, you know? That's a very, very <laughs> good question and I, I would like to actually answer that question because we did have to change our you know the way we think about it once we started looking at the people who are applying but can you explain a little bit more about this persona approach it seems to me that's something that is not unique to our industry I mean in, in any marketing campaign you should probably uh, sort of organize it around persona so can you explain that concept a little bit more I have a feeling that it would be a useful concept to students who are working on any challenge in exculture or for their own business. So it doesn't have to be limited to the MSAB challenge. So sure. what do you think is that? 
So personas are essentially, you know, what is what is the typical student for that program? Is it, you know, a single mom working from home looking to get ahead or, or, or to do a career change? Or is it someone who's in a career but wants to change careers and maybe work more internationally? Um, so you're looking at age, you're looking at gender, um, you're looking at socioeconomic status, and you're kind of saying, okay, these are these are the typical types of students, what they're looking for, what's that unifying factor? Um, because if you can't do that, if you can't can't identify that, it makes it very, very difficult to then market to them and then also to recruit them because um, in order to recruit someone, as I mentioned before, you, you want to know and learn um, what it is they're looking for. And so you'll get exhausted going and asking each individual person. But if you have these, you know, personas, then you can kind of create, you know, different sections or segments of, of, of outreach and messaging. So um, they're literally maybe getting a different type of advertisement, right? Yes, absolutely. We have different advertising campaigns determining that is that are determined by where we met that student virtually or in person. Because again, if uh, let's say if you do advertisement online, for example, on Facebook or LinkedIn or, or whatever platform you use, you can choose pretty precisely the, the sort of the description of that client, right? You can choose the geography, you can choose age, gender, uh, profession, uh, marital status, often you have that information. So you can go like interests. And so you can literally show different types of ads depending on what your audience is, right? So, so when, yes. we, look at, when mm -hmm. we look at MSIB, again, uh, probably I should have said a little bit more about the program itself <clears throat> um, very quickly, and I'll, I'll give a more detailed overview of the curriculum, but MSAB is a program, MSAB stands for Masters of Science in International Business. So it's kind of similar to MBA, but there are two big differences or two main differences. Uh, it's international business. So MBA is a generic management, so business administration in general. Whereas uh, IB, that's the managing international operations essentially. So uh, it would be management in companies that do business internationally. And by that, it could be either companies that have international suppliers or international clients or international partners or maybe international employees. So there is some international aspect to it. And second, we have that science component in it. In it. So we have a little bit more focus on research. Like general MBA, they have a little bit more focus on like financial aspects. So they have like accounting and finance courses on those subjects where we try to focus more on managing people and so a little bit more research component to it. So how to do research, how to, you know, kind of that scientific component is a little stronger. So, but overall it's like MBA for international business. Second, it's an online program. So it's a 100% online program uh, for the MBA programs we offer here at the Bryan School of Business and Economics. We have uh, executive MBA, basically people with experience. We have uh, regular MBA for people with less experience and it can be taken online or face-to-face -face or evening. So we have different formats. The MSIB is offered only online. So uh, you don't have to be in North Carolina in Greensboro to take this program. And so talking about personas, when we developed the program, we thought that the typical student will be an inter international person. So someone overseas who wants to get a degree from a reputable American university, but perhaps does not want to relocate to the United States for a year or two because, you know, it's expensive. Maybe they have a job, whatever the reasons. And so we do have some students like that. But surprisingly, we discovered that the main customer or the main market segment would be actually local students here in North Carolina who have full-time jobs, who have families, who are here, but they just cannot quit their job to go full-time to school. And so they choose this online version where they have the, the, the flexibility of both keeping the job, uh, you know, taking care of the family duties and whatever else needs to be done there, and studying at the same time. And so uh, at this time, we kind of have three main categories that we work with. One is the local full-time employees. Uh, and the reason they are local is because uh, if you are from North Carolina, part of your education will be covered, you know, part of your tuition will be covered by the state. And so all of a sudden it makes it much more affordable for the locals because uh, it's about half of the, of the tuition is covered by the, by the state. So that turns out to be the most populous, the, the biggest segment of the market. Second, we still have some international, uh, again, younger, older, but people who would like to get an American diploma, an American degree, but perhaps cannot travel all the way to the United States. And third, we actually have some uh, that are graduates from the school, you know, literally are getting their bachelor's now and will be applying for the fall, 
a kind of more traditional master students a little younger but then again for whatever reason they think they will be looking for a job and they think they probably don't want to go to school face to face they would like to have the time flexibility and so one of the things jennifer does and thank you so much for that they organize regular what they call information sessions for the students and we just had one last week so we had a total of like i don't know like full huge room so i don't know 150 students maybe i don't know like a huge room. but that's for all of the graduate programs and so some of them were interested specifically in msib and again as i said we had all three categories there so we had some people who have full-time jobs like we had that man he works for volvo volvo the the car makers so they make trucks here in greensboro the head office of volvo for north america is here in in greensboro and so the, the, the person, uh, the man, uh, so he's a Swede, so he's from Sweden, but he was relocated to Greensboro to do some, like he's an engineer by training, and so he does something related to uh, some, some IT stuff in the truck, some, some information technologies. But while here, his employer said, why don't you do a degree? We will pay for your education. And because he will be traveling back and forth between Sweden and, and the United States, he cannot be here full time. He has a job, he is not always in the United States, so the online version works very well for him. So he's kind of similar to this first persona that we envisioned, you know, a foreigner who wants to get an internet, I mean, an American diploma, and he may be here from time to time, but still he is, he's not available for full time. Then there were a couple more people who are local who have jobs and they just say, I want to, you know, get a degree, but, you know, I have too many responsibilities to quit job, my job, so I have to stay in school. So that's a local with a full-time job. And then we had two students who are still in college at our school. One of them, in fact, said uh, that he is in my course as we speak, and she just likes very much the um, international business, uh, you know, subject. And she wanted to continue her education, and so she's looking at both MBA and MSIB, and she believes that MSIB is something that is more interesting to her. So she might be like 21, 22, maybe 23 at most. And so she wants to. So we kind of have all three of those groups, and obviously, what attracts them to the program are very different things. So uh, I guess it would be a different message if I had to recruit them from, from different groups. I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone. I mean, there may be more personas that we can work with, but those, the three that come to my mind. I don't know, am I missing anyone? Uh, um, not, not that I can think of. I think more personas typically emerge when you're able to gather more data. And so being such a new program, I think it's, yeah. it's hard to get our hands on that data. Um, a, a tactic that a lot of schools use, even on the undergraduate level, is they will survey um, the students that enroll into the program, and then they'll also survey the people that decline the program. So let's say they get accepted and they choose to do something else. And so th through those surveys, they're learning about what other schools they're applying to, the financial packages, and then the students' motivations. Why do they choose these other schools over them or why did they choose that school over others and so through that survey data you're also able to really more closely you know refine your personas and get even better at your targeted recruitment Jennifer if I may ask you again many students will be applying to a more general MBA so for example what are the uh, personas or what types of personas do you sort of work with or, or have in your mind or I don't know on paper whichever way the strategy is written for, for the general MBA program well, and so I think, yeah, so the personas for those programs have also even informed the shape of the program itself, right? So we don't just have one MBA, we really right. have three MBA options. Now they're all the MBA program, um, but we have a program for early career professionals that's more cohort focused. It's for those younger early career professionals who are really looking to go through the program as a group, learn from each other, uh, develop these professional connections. And um, the statistics show that over over 90% of the students that graduate from UNCG will stay in the state. And so chances are they're going to be work colleagues, you know, on into the future. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a program for experienced professionals. And so that takes the courses that we typically offer, puts them in the evening. We also allow them to take part-time study. Um, and so listening to our personas, listening to our audience and what they're looking for, we're able to format the coursework and then also change our messaging for that program and we even named it something different. It's an MBA for experienced professionals. Um, and then more recently, we've also launched um, an online MBA. So it's exclusively online. However, it's only for experienced professionals. Um, our faculty have, have seen that, you know, in order to be successful, um, you should have had, you know, some experience out in the field in order to do an online uh, MBA just because of the level of, of experience that you're going to need to benefit. Uh -huh. So I didn't realize that the MBA program, the online MBA program is available only to experienced people. How much experience is required? 
five to seven years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so from that perspective, MSIB may be <clears throat> entertainable, like if you don't have much experience, but you want to do it online, so that may be an option. Uh, oh, absolutely. Option. Yes, absolutely. Um, another question, so I was once visiting the university, um, uh, another university, and so um, while I was there, competing universities were running those, what they call recruitment tours. And so one university that impressed me most was University of Alabama. So what they did is they have two big buses that go campus to campus. And so like huge, nice, you know, looking buses. And they come to campus, they open the doors, they have those huge screens, plasma screens, and they have a professional team. And so they basically do recruitment, uh, you know, a way that feels almost like a little, I don't know, like a, like a pre-game party before us, you know, like a football game. And so it's a lot of celebration and, you know, uh, like really, really impressive, you know, emotionally, it's hard to, you know, just watch. And from, from what I hear, they actually have students from all around the country, even though Alabama is somewhere in the middle of the country that most people cannot even point on the map, they actually have students from all around the country, from Wyoming, from Colorado, that's actually where I saw them. And so do we do anything like that? Or is it common that universities do that kind of, you know, like almost like a traveling circus type of deal? So UAB was actually at a conference yesterday in Charlotte uh, at, at, at um, James Front uh, University uh, down there um, as part of a panel where we were also invited. Um, and yes, they very much have that whole like three ring circus, like there's lot, the whole show going on, right? Yeah, like, I think, like a whole show, exactly. <laughs> but UAB is also, you know, a household name in the States. They've, they've been in the national football championship uh, for, I think, like five out of the past seven years or something crazy like that. Um, so because they've seen the success in the sports and because their, their school is so large, um, I think that they have that name recognition. And so they have that coming in. So they kind of have that swagger. If you will, like coming on campus and kind of, um, you know, sharing that. And so, and so they have no issue there. I think for UNCG, for us to do something similar, um, we wouldn't be able to go to a whole nother state and do that because we don't have that name recognition. Well, in some, in some industries, we absolutely do. Um, but in others, um, we just don't have that name recognition to the general public. And I think that is one tactic that colleges and universities use is they really focus on investing in their sports and their athletics to get their name out there. And then they go and celebrate their, their academic programs. I also, I went to LSU undergrad, Louisiana State University, and they did the very same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, those of you who don't know uh, football, and we're talking about American football. So the football where they used hands actually, not feet to play it. So uh, in the United States, it's big. And so University of Alabama, for example, is one of the major players there. In fact, they were the champions some not so long ago. And so it's, it's almost like a religion in the States. So uh, I was actually there um, two years ago and it was like two, two months before the, the game, but people already started camping out and already, you know, preparing for the event. Like why? I mean, it's still like a weeks away <laughs> and they already started celebrating. So it's a big deal. And then they have this huge stadium and, you know, people literally buy apartments around the stadium specifically to come once a year for the game to stay in that apartment. So like the bridge bridges. So it's a whole different, you know, uh, mindset. And what's interesting also talking about that. So if you, um, in the United States, there are websites that allow you to see the salaries of public employees. And by public employees, it can be anyone from the governor of the state, like the president of the state, all the way to, I don't know, some, some low grassroots employees, you know, that work somewhere at a local university or school and, you know, do some, some you know, like uh, minor jobs. And so when you do it state by state and look who, ha who makes the most money in the state, so in about 40 out of 50 American states, the richest or the, the highest salary in the state is the football coach at the university. Like the football coach makes more money than the governor of the state, than the president of the university, than everybody. <laughs> and one of the reasons is because, you know, they use those sports specifically to promote recruitment. And like University of Texas is big when it comes to, to sports, uh, Miami, University of Miami, Alabama. So some of those, you know, in North Carolina, it's more about basketball. So it's always, you know, basketball. So that's a big deal. So, uh, but yeah, so the universities pay a lot and run it as a business specifically because that's what attracts students to the camp campus. And so that's a big part of the recruitment strategy. I don't think other countries do that. I mean, I don't think they have like first college sports are not really a major event in most countries. Like here, when we have the, you know, like the football, for example, the, the college uh, league, 
I mean, that's like national thing. So everybody, uh, you know, you may not be in college anymore, but you still cheer for your college team. So um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, one quick question. Uh, so then in terms of advertisement, going back to MSAB and the Brown School of Business and Economics. So how exactly do we advertise them? So we, we mentioned the information sessions for the students who are interested. So we do them face to face and we do them online when students express interest. But how do they learn about us in the first place? So in general, the Bryan School, we focus more on the key features and benefits across all programs in the Bryan School. We do some program-specific marketing and advertising, but for the most part, we're more focused on, on ge in general, celebrating the excellence of the school um, and those key components. And then when it comes down to, okay, a student raises their hand and they're interested, then they might get connected with a recruiter who will then talk about all the different programs. So that's why it's really important also um, and when you see a successful you know recruitment school typically it's because that recruitment person is partnering with the programs and there's a conversation back and forth and they're working together um, on recruitment um, with the faculty and the programs and the recruiter and marketing um, so but in general we focus more on you know broad marketing of the whole school um, and then there is like I said some you know specific marketing going on but for the most part that's really handled by recruitment so I've seen some billboards all around the um, uh, city, and then obviously you do some advertisement on Facebook, right? Uh, oh yes, social media. Um, we do a lot of paid Google advertisements. Um, I mean, there is a there is a, a whole team of people working on on that. Our social media, creating stories to share about our alumni, and I think that's also been um, a little bit of a, um, a stumbling block for MSIB. Is is a lot of times for a program when I'm looking to promote a program, I'm, I'm talking to past students and alumni, um, and 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 celebrating those successes. Um, and I think that's what really speaks to interested students however for this program being so new um, we we focus more on you know other other benefits like the faculty and um, you know the cross-cultural communication and things like that uh, a few days ago I was interviewed by someone um, uh, again uh, this information it seems like we have several stories if I share my screen here it seems like we have several stories in different media about for example like sculpture is my oh, yeah. screen showing up am I showing my screen yes that's the one with the um, um, Excalture, or am I showing the wrong one? Uh, um, no, there was another one that says celebrating 10 years. Yeah, um, and it was a yeah, more recent one somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I guess yeah, I'm sharing their own screen, I guess. But yes, yeah, so would that be considered part of the recruitment as well? Uh, the stories about the things, that wonderful things we do at the, at the school? So that was a marketing effort. However, you might have seen that I also shared it on my social media as yeah, the recruiter. Yeah. And so it was kind of a, a partnership in that way. I try to learn and take everything that marketing is doing and incorporate it into what I'm doing just to amplify their efforts. Um, and, so, and so technically it was a marketing tactic. Um, but there's another one, for instance, that I'm helping them do uh, involving an alumni from the MSA program um, to write a blog about how important it is to go and get your graduate degree. However, you don't, if you don't need a graduate degree um, to, to, to be a CPA in the States, however, um, it, it's very advantageous. And there's a lot of reasons why. However, the students don't realize it when they're coming right out of undergrad. And so we're developing this blog post to help kind of translate that. And so that's more of a, a recruitment. But, but again, it's a partnership. So, you know, working hand in hand on those types of tactics yeah, yeah makes perfect sense and one last question I'm not sure if you have the exact numbers for a school uh, but in general how much universities spend on recruitment or on advertisement like what is that are we talking about like thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions I, I understand it may depend on the school but I mean what are the general sort of numbers we're talking about it very much depends on the school, and it also uh, it varies just in how, how specific they get across schools. I just attended this past January a conference in Baltimore and met with other recruiters, you know, from across the nation, and talked about this exact issue, and, and especially as it relates to graduate uh, marketing and recruitment, because not all universities have a separate graduate recruitment and marketing budget. Um, and for for my position, for instance, I am exclusively dedicated to the Bryan School graduate programs. And there's no other college or school on this campus that has that, right? Um, so our school has said, this is important. We want to invest in this. And so they've gone forth and created this position. Um, there's a team of people in the building right next door to me. And um, I want to say it's three people, and they're representing 150 programs. Whereas uh -huh. I am- so At our university, then we have 
three people for the whole university and then we have a separate team for the business school one just me and i'm focused on these six programs uh -huh, these um six. so as you can imagine um, i'm able to get a lot more you know you're seeing a lot you're seeing me a lot more right, than right. you might see them I, um, honestly, I don't program. even know who the other three people are i know you obviously i know the person who worked in this position before you so you're always around so yes uh, but i don't know who the other <laughs> three well they have 160 programs to, to, to you know to promote i mean we are exactly. one of 160 clients for them essentially exactly right? they say brian's will taking care of jennifer's there and then they focus on all the other ones maybe that's why we don't know yeah that. um but as far as budget goes um it varies wildly um and so i do have budget allocation for you know career fairs and for travel and for development um and things like that um and however the, the majority of the money is spent on marketing um and and really getting the word out there because other than that i mean it's my time and these information sessions that are really you you know free if you will for us uh, but it takes development and time so um, they're more looking at the staff expertise for that mm -hmm. okay very informative in fact I'm learning something new here too so, <laughs> uh, I want to spend a couple more minutes just talking about the program in general but students again if you have questions either about the MSIB program or about the Bryan School of Business and Economics or about ENCG or about the recruitment of students by universities in general as always, you can ask those questions by either typing them in the Q&A window, you have that, or better yet, just raise your hand and uh, we will add you to the panel and we will engage in the discussion. And so let me share my screen here just to show you um, a couple of slides and talk a little bit about the MSAB program specifically. So Masters of Science in International Business offered by the Bryan School of Business and Economics. Again, those of you who are outside the United States, the word school in the United States can mean many different things. It can be like school of thought, you know, more like philosophy direction. It can be a school as where, you know, teenagers go or children go like a school. But it's also used, unlike in other countries, it's also used uh, to denote a university. Like when we, when, when we say, you know, you go to a good school, you know, for your graduate studies, that can be like, you know, Harvard, Stanford, University of North Carolina for that matter. So that the word school may actually mean university or college or within the university you have different departments and so again in most other countries you would call them faculties or you would call them departments in the united states you often call them schools up like we have school of nursing we have school of education we have school of business and so those would be again schools so in our case the Bryan school of business and economics that's part of the university of north carolina that specializes in business and so the msib is one of the newest programs we offer and so uh, that program, I'll, I'll skip directly, yeah, that's what we want to talk about. So that program is only one and a half years old. So we have our first cohort, uh, they started in 2018, and we have a few students who already graduated. And then we have some who are taking it part-time, so they're still in the program. And then we have some new people who enrolled uh, this year. And so just a little bit of information here. So as I said, it's 100% online, so it gives you flexibility. You don't have to be in Greensboro and you don't have to be here at a particular hour. So you can uh, take your uh, do your degree um, from wherever you are uh, on a flexible time schedule. The focus is on international business. So it's kind of like MBA, but specifically for international business. And uh, so, yeah, hopefully it will make you more competitive when the time comes to, uh, to apply for jobs. Uh, so one important thing here that I would like to say or even brag about is that uh, when we recognized a need uh, for a specialized international business graduate degree, uh, we were given full freedom to design this program from scratch. So what we did was we had a committee of people. And so what we did, we did a lot of research. So we talked to many industry experts. We talked to potential students. We talked to employers trying to understand what a person, what a manager, international business manager needs. And so we started with the need, with the assessment of needs, and then developed the curriculum around those needs. So uh, we literally were able to design a program specifically for international business professionals. And so that allowed us to put some things in the program that other programs don't have, and perhaps drop some things that other programs usually offer, but we have discovered are not as important. And so we decided not to waste time on them. So everything in this program is always, you know, sort of started with the question, do we really need it? And if the answer was yes, then it's in the program. 
And then if the question is no, then it's not in the program. And if the question was yes, and we did not have a faculty, a professor to teach the course, we would go out and conduct a global search and hire people specifically for this program. In fact, uh, we have, I think, a total of 11 professors teaching in the program. And it happens to be the case that pretty much everybody is from a different country. So it just happened to be that everybody's from somewhere else. And the reason for that is that we hired about four or five professional additional professors for the program. And it just happened to be that because we were looking globally, some of the best ones came from different countries. And so we have some professors from uh, you know, Finland and from Turkey and from China and from India and from Ukraine and from uh, the United States, obviously, Ghana, Bulgaria, I may be missing a few other countries. So we have people from all around the world teaching in this particular program. Exculture, the project that you're participating in is a big component of the MSAB program. And in fact, there is a course where the students have to take Exculture as a course. So for most of the students, it's part of the course. Whereas for the MSAB students, it is the course. They get much more training before the project starts. Then they have many, you know, much higher expectations during the project. And then after the project is over, they still have to do some work. They have to write a reflection paper. They have to do more things uh, than most students don't have to do. So for them, it's a much more immersive experience. Um, so yes, the program sort of revolves around this international collaboration, hands-on projects and things like that. Now, the program can be completed in one year or doing full-time or in two years if you do it part-time. In theory, you can even extend it to three years, but we don't recommend that. I mean, it's doable in two years. If you, if you have a job, you can do it in two years. We had a few students who graduated in one year and they were able to do it while having full-time jobs. So if you do it in one year, you have to do a lot of courses and you have to do it summer, fall and spring. So you would take four courses in the fall, four co courses in the spring, two courses in the summer. So it's pretty intensive, but it's doable. But again, if for you it's too intensive, if you don't have that time uh, you know, to devote to the program, you can do it part-time, just taking two courses a semester and one courses every summer and get it done in two years. So the program is designed to be sort of lean. So the accreditation requires that we offer uh, no less than 30 credit hours. So basically no less than 10 full courses. And that's exactly what we did. So we didn't add anything on top of that to not waste your time, but we have enough to be accredited and to provide the necessary training uh, to offer quality education. Uh, and then what you can do with this program, I mean, you can do basically manage uh, people in the international context, just in about any industry. So uh, as I said, if the company has international employees, maybe has international teams, maybe has international suppliers, international customers, international partners, international subsidiaries, or maybe if you are planning to either go and work overseas or vice versa, maybe you have expatriates at your office, uh, that requires special set of skills and knowledge uh, that a generic management degree may not give you. So you may need to have that international sort of flavor to your degree. And that's exactly what we do. So you may end up working for a nonprofit or a government agency or a private organization or in education or hospitality, just about any industry. But if there is this international component to it, then this program would be a much better choice for you than a generic MBA. And by the way, the employers usually do like that. So they want people who are specialized rather than generic. So if the, if the job requires doing international business, then yeah, this would be a preferred option for most employers. Um, we offer a lot of career resources and guidance, and the program is pretty small, by the way, at this time. So we, we're still in teams, so meaning that uh, we are still, I think it's more than 10, but fewer than 20 students at this time, something like 18 total. And so it's a relatively small program, so we know the names of each of the students. Uh, you get to talk to each professor individually, so it's not a huge MBA program where you may have hundreds of students and, you know, the, the, the university and the professors never have time for everybody. So this one is still small and personal to the point where you become friends and colleagues with your professors, with the administrators. They know you, you know them. So it's a much more sort of private type of experience, more, how should I call it, um, much, much closer relationship with the faculty um, as opposed to a generic, you know, big size program. Uh, in terms of the cost, uh, so uh, it's, um, the, the total cost is $35,000. So that's basically what the university wants us to charge. But if you happen to be in state, the university will cover most of it for you. 
So basically, if you are a resident of North Carolina, the university, uh, I mean, the state will cover most of the tuition and you will be paying only $15,000. If you happen to be from a different country, in a different country, you would be paying about $22,000, almost $23,000. I know by standards of other countries, it's a lot of money. Uh, I know that in Europe, for example, even top schools charge in hundreds, maybe in thousands per year, but you know, like, like single thousands. Whereas in the United States, the education is much more expensive. And in fact, these numbers are relatively low if you compare it to, for example, what Wake Forest charges or what Duke or whatever private schools are around, what they charge. They're not necessarily better. I mean, when you look at the rankings, we, we do very well, in fact, very, very well in some categories. Uh, but uh, again, that's the level of prices for education in the United States. I mean, arguably the United States has the, the best higher education, or at least, you know, the universities are typically ranked as the best, uh, but it costs money. And so one of the reasons they can do it is because it's expensive and they can devote and attract the necessary resources to do it. So this third number, that, that's a very peculiar case where you are a non-North Carolina resident uh, living in North Carolina, but basically these are the two main categories. If you are a resident in North Carolina, it's $15,000. If you are a foreigner, it's $22,000. So, uh, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, application and all of that, we can talk about it some other time, but it's very typical. So we need your resume, we need your GMAT or GRE score, we need your recommendations, transcripts, uh, nothing super unusual there. Uh, Nora, I see, I mean, Nora, sorry, I see your big long question and honestly, it's a lot of text. So why don't I add you here to the panel and you just ask it in, in plain language. So uh, you should appear here any second. Uh, so, and again, if there are any other questions, you can guys either type them or raise your hand and um, join us here. So Nora, uh, do you want to ask a question? Yes, I just wanted to ask that there are many students in fact I was just talking to my Indian friend today and he said that he doesn't want to continue his study just because he's not you know getting um, the updated versions and the, about the technologies and how the business are working across the world or in the West so I am you know I'm like I cannot afford to go out of India but like for now I'm just stopping my studies just because I have to look after my family, I have to support my father, and you know, paying uh, for private educational assistance is like very costly over here. So, so that's why, like he was like that, I'm not going to uh, continue for now. So, if this program is like for Asian or for other people who are like uh, in Pakistan or somewhere, so that they can easily you know afford it. Like it's a virtual platform, so it would be not that expensive to go abroad and study about the, you know, study about the system, the business, how the world works, uh, and uh, everything related to business science. Uh, it's like, is it a cheaper way or it's not uh, like, not cheaper, but a reasonable way to, you know, work in the daytime and, you know, and study in your flexible hour for the students who are not in, uh, United States. Yeah, uh, you're asking a very good question and I think there are several different issues here that we might want to address. One, is it even worth going to school and spending all that money and time on education? And so I don't know how it is in different countries, but Jennifer, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the United States these days, the undergraduate degree is basically a must. If you want to have a good job, you can't really, I mean, I suppose you can still get some jobs in maybe factories or maybe some, I don't know, oil fields maybe without a bachelor's degree, but normally you need a bachelor's degree just, you know, just to get a job. Many jobs may not require a specific degree, but they would say bachelor's for equivalent required. Masters, in my opinion, and that's where, you know, Jennifer tell me you may have more statistics, but at least in business, it seems like it's a very good investment in a sense that it's usually only two years. Sometimes you can even get it done in one year. And it may cost you like looking at our level of tuition, you know, anywhere between let's say, Ten to forty thousand dollars, depending on the university and depending on the cost of living, but you know something like that. But it seems to me, at least in management, uh, or you know, if you do sort of like business type jobs, if you work for a company and you do some sort of managerial uh, type of work, it seems to me it will actually add probably at least twenty, thirty, maybe even forty, fifty thousand dollars to your annual income. 
Uh, I don't have the statistics specifically on our school in terms of the starting salary, but I remember seeing those statistics for other schools. And so in the United States with the bachelor's in management, you usually would be looking at salaries somewhere, I don't know, like 40, 50, maybe plus or minus 60, maybe some, you know, depending on what state you are, what city you are, uh, you know, what kind of job you do. But it would be some, somewhere like, you know, 50 plus or minus 20, maybe depending on what you do. The MBAs, it seems to me, or other masters in management related disciplines, it seems like many of them would have a starting salary closer to 100. And I've seen that for some universities, it's even six figure starting salaries. And again, it's a lot of money to get that degree. But you literally get your money back like a year or two years after you get the job. And so it seems like it's a very, very good investment because it's quick. And at the same time, it you know, offers you many more opportunities when it comes to career advancement. These are um, statistics that are very, sorry to interrupt. These are statistics that are, are very closely uh, monitored by independent agencies. And so for instance, there just came a report out um, this past January um, that compared all of the North Carolina business schools. And so essentially they looked at the average out-of-pocket costs. So how much did the student actually pay? There's what we charge in tuition, but then there's what the student actually ends up right. paying, right? Due to scholarships and things like that. So they looked at the average out-of-pocket cost of those graduates and then the average starting salary of those graduates. And they developed this ROI, right? They, they were comparing the ROI on a degree. Return, return on investment. So for every dollar yes. you pay, how much you get back long term. Exactly. And they compared that across all of the business schools in North Carolina. Um, and, and ours, we, we ranked number one. So ours, given, given our low cost of our program, but the excellent business partnerships that we have and how, how much work we do to partner our students with businesses where they will get those lucrative, uh, you know, high paying positions, um, we work really hard on that. And so we rank very, very highly on ROI. Other actually, schools, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. You're, you're right. I actually have seen, seen some statistics. So the University of North Carolina, Greensboro specifically, we may not be top one in general rankings. Like, I mean, Duke may be more recognizable school, or I mean, obviously Harvard MBA would be more recognizable. But when you look at the dollar for dollar, so like if Harvard is here and we are here, so yes, we are not quite there, but we are high, but we are like one fifth of the cost. And so when you look at the return on investment, all of a sudden we're very, exactly. very attractive. Exactly. That's a really important case to make. And that's a case that I make all the time when I'm talking to students is if, if, if they're comparing our program to other programs, I talk about the investment that they're going to be making and how much they're going to be getting back. And so, you know, I have a report right here on my desk. Um, I was just looking at it this morning is that that per program, we're looking at those averages. Has that ROI changed over the years? And so we look at that very closely in our office. Um, you know, is our average starting salary going up for certain programs and how is that looking? Um, and so, so yes, that's very much something that we, we so, so uh, what is the calculate. ROI then? So is it like dollar for dollar? How many dollars can you expect back lifetime? Uh, do, do we have the exact numbers? I want to say it was in like the 30% range. I can, I can pull. Um, I the, would not be surprised that, you know, for every dollar you invest in your education, if you look at your lifelong earning potential, I think you would be getting many, many more dollars back over the course of the life for every dollar you invest, right? And so that's a chart that you, you'll you also see a lot of recruitment, uh, especially in graduate recruitment use, is they'll, they'll watch the average earning potential of a student up for an undergraduate degree, and then they'll they'll chart you know the same for a master's degree student, and then where that line intersects um, is, is where you can say, okay, this is where it makes the most sense to get a, a graduate degree and move on, you know? Right, right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to follow up and share that article with you. So, so that's one issue. So do we even want to get the degree? Second, uh, you asked uh, about international students not being able to pay it. Uh, is it possible to get it for free or with a stipend? If you are in India or Pakistan, it's so far away. So there are always some programs. And so I'll be honest with you, when it comes to MSAB, it becomes a little tricky. Like for example, we have a few students here at the UNCG at this time who were ex students in different countries or universities but came to us to get the graduate degree. In fact, one of my uh, close friends and students, uh, Jan Strivik, he's a German guy, he was in Pennsylvania, he wanted to do his MBA and he specifically wanted to come to UNCG. And so he was admitted to our MBA program and he got full scholarship, so we paid for him. Uh, Simona De Loca is another student uh, that's, by the way, he's the one who's actually working for Exculture and sending you all those emails. So he's the one who sends the emails from admin. Again, we fully covered his undergraduate and now his master's degree. 
both of them will be graduating in a couple of weeks, uh, in a few weeks uh, this semester. So we have some students who do get full stipend, and in fact, quite a few of them do. But the thing is that most of the students who get stipends, at least at our university, and I think it's the case of most, it would not be just free money, it would be money in exchange for some work, essentially. So they would call them graduate assistantships, and the deal is that uh, we pay for your education, but in exchange you work with a professor as a research assistant, as a teaching assistant, helping with different things. And so where it becomes a little trickier is um, if it's an online program like this one. So it makes it a little bit more difficult for us to sort of engage you in the activities that we need help with and offer some sort of a stipend in exchange. So if it's full-time online from a different country, it would be much, much less likely that we can offer a stipend or, or some sort of an assistantship. And I'm not sure again, Jennifer, do we do we offer any stipends for foreign students who are not, not, not for foreign? online students? Yeah. Um, but um, as we spoke last week, we had a virtual information session with a student who is paying for the graduate program through his employer. And a lot yeah. of employers will offer uh, tuition reimbursement. So he's paid for his undergraduate degree through his employer. And now he's doing the same with his graduate degree. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's the short answer. Yeah. Ah, so basically, you guys are offering us to you know to learn and to explore the business science like master programs, like by working, not just by you know you have to read the books and that old boring way that we we used to do before all this technology, right? Well, again, it may depend on the specific program. So you mean like learning by doing, right? Yeah. Again, for some programs, it may be a little bit more suitable than for others. Um, in management, international business, in this program, as I said, every course, almost every course in the program will have some uh, hands-on uh, program, uh, you know, project projects. Like for example, like sculpture here is one of them, but there are many more. So where you will be asked to uh, complete a, a real project, either for a client or with a team. And so you sort of kind of have this experiential component embedded in the courses. I know some countries have whole programs that are sort of developed more as an apprenticeship. Like for example, I, did, I went to high school in Germany and, uh, and then also spent another year in Germany as an intern at Volkswagen. And uh, so I remember that Volkswagen, they literally get the kids out of high school and then train them on the job. So they have this whole industry of essentially uh, apprenticeship programs. And so you join Volkswagen at the age of like 18, right after you graduate from school, but then you get a lot of training on the job. So they teach you, you know, trade and then, you know, like all the way to management. So it's almost, it's like a whole different philosophy. Uh, Japan is a little similar to that. So they also have this, you know, employment for life usually. So once you join a company, you sort of stay with the company and the company trains you. In the United States, the, the philosophy seems to be a little bit different, at least in management. So they, they always say that you go and get the degree on your own and come to us, we'll get you a job. But we will not train you because if we train you, you will get the training and you will get to somebody, you know, you will switch companies and you will work for somebody else. So on the job training is much less popular in the United States. I mean, there may be some development and training going on, but usually employees are expected to get training on their own through formal education. Sometimes the employer will pay for that. But again, it still would be done at a university outside the job, like big training. So not just some little, you know, seminar, but like big training. So again, it may depend on the, on the country and on the tradition and all the philosophy. Uh, exactly. In the United yes. States, people change jobs so frequently that employers sort of, you know, they, they select, but they don't necessarily invest much in training. Am I getting that right, Jennifer? That's my impression. I don't know. I mean, is it? Yeah. Um, Jason, John is asking here, will we have access to the quantitative and qualitative data that was, was, was gathered in the development of the program? Yes, I can share a lot of information. I'll, in fact, I have some of that information. So we did a lot of, you know, sort of need assessment, as we call it. Uh, Jennifer, if, uh, do you have any information that you can share there? I'm not sure how much you can disclose, especially when it comes to the specific, you know, marketing stuff. But would you be able to give us something, like maybe that report that you showed on return on investment and things? Yeah, absolutely. I can share that. Um, and then I'll look and see um, what, so I'm, I'm a fairly new employee uh, in this office. And so, but surely they have uh, reports that we can share um, that, that occurred previously. So I'll gather that and, and follow that up and send it to you. Okay. Yeah, that sounds fair. And so for the MSAB challenge, uh, normally we don't give the contacts of the um, company representative. 
So we give you, we ask you to send the questions to admin at Excalture.org. But for MSAB, feel free to contact me directly. And so I'll be happy to answer those questions for you directly. And then if needed, I can reach out to Jennifer specifically with the questions related to promotion. So if you want to need to, uh, if you need more information, but we'll be available for you to give you more information when needed. Um, and I guess that's it. So uh, we've covered everything we planned. Um, so if you have any additional questions, just email them to us. And um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.